Hello everybody and welcome back to The Second Shelf and to the first video in this new series, Reading the Decade. If you have been following my channel, uh, you might remember that I one of my plans, reading plans for 2020, is read books uh, that were published between 2010 and 2019. And I called this project Reading the Decade, even though you know that I think the decade starts in 2011 and runs until the end of this year. But hey, most people count 2010 to 2019 as a decade, and I'm malleable. There you go. So what I'll do is I look at the publishing year, in this case 2010, and then I pick two books, uh, a fiction work and a non-fiction work that made an impact in that year that was praised or won a prize, uh, but I missed reading it. Um, and then I read it and talk about it obviously. Um, I will also, in, in these videos, talk about the book published in that uh, particular year that I uh, really loved. So for each year, I will pick a book published in that year uh, that is one of my favorites. That doesn't necessarily mean that I read it in the publishing year. So here we go for the first video, the first year, 2010. Oh, and I forgot to say um, there were a couple of people when I announced uh, this this project uh, who were interested in maybe reading along or following along. So at the end of each video, I will announce my two picks, the nonfiction and the fiction pick for the next year in case, you know, you want to read along in between videos. Um, because the decade has 10 years, no matter when you start counting, and the year has 12 months, that means I will make a video every, you know, one and a half months or something. So the next one for 2011 will probably be up um, mid-March or something, just in case you want to know how much time you will have to read the two books that I picked for 2011. So the fiction pick for the year 2010 was a debut novel, whoops, <laughs> The Girl Who Fell From the Sky by Heidi W. Duro, um, an American writer. The book is set in the 1980s, and the main character whose story we follow, it's a coming-of-age story, is Rachel, who is 11 when the book opens. Like the author, uh, Rachel is biracial. She has a, a white Danish mother and a black a GI uh, father. And when the book opens, um, uh, Rachel is picked up by her paternal grandmother um, to live with her because... Uh, Rachel is picked up from the hospital, I should say, um, and we learn, even though we don't know the details, that Rachel's mother and her two siblings uh, have been killed, and Rachel is the sole survivor of a family tragedy. We don't know uh, about the father, he is sort of absent at the beginning of the story, and the story is told then from various points of views, Rachel's point of view, but also um, Rachel's mother, Nella, um, um, a neighbor who is uh, not the, the employer, I'm sorry, the employer of Nella, um, who tries to figure out what happened uh, to to her employee, uh, a young boy about Rachel's age who lived in the same apartment building um, that Rachel and her uh, mother and siblings lived, and some, you know, other voices. So it's told from various perspectives. It's not a linear um, uh, uh, storyline, but through these various perspectives, we get pieces of a puzzle, and at the end of the book, we know what happened. Uh, Rachel's um, uh, struggle is not only, of course, dealing with her grief, losing her mother and her two siblings, uh, but one of the main topics of the book is also the question of race. Um, Rachel is fairly light-skinned and she has blue eyes, and the, uh, the environment of her black grandmother uh, is a black community, so Rachel goes to a black school, um, and she is bullied because of her light skin. Uh, she's called Oreo because she's not, quote-unquote, really black. So the, the theme of what race means uh, to Rachel um, and to the community she lives on is one of the main themes. If you have watched my January Tops and Flops, you will know that I didn't think the book 
was that good. It's not by any means a, a bad book. The writing is good um, and the premise is interesting and the themes are certainly interesting. But I thought uh, the first half was really good and then it felt as if the author lost control over the story and it sort of just fizzled out. So I was not... Um, yeah, I was hopeful, of course, because the book got a lot of praise uh, and won prizes. As you, won, as you can see, this horrible sticker that is printed on the cover. I'm not going to talk about that. You know how much I love that. Um, but it's, yeah, it didn't fulfill the promise uh, that I thought uh, it held. I had much better luck with my non-fiction book, and that was Cleopatra, A Life by Stacey Schiff. Uh, Stacey Schiff is an American author who uh, used to work in publishing and then started to write biographies. This is her fourth or fifth, uh, but I had never read her. Um, and I really, really love this book. Um, it's, of course, the life of Cleopatra. So we learn about uh, Cleopatra's life from her birth until her death. Um, uh, Stacey Schiff discusses in the beginning uh, the fact that there is very little um, um, original source material. There are no diaries or anything uh, of Cleopatra and um, Stacey Schiff had to make do with accounts by mostly Roman, mostly men, writing about Cleopatra after her death. Um, and but Stacey Schiff, despite the fact that there's so little uh, material, is able to, um, as one of my commenters said, uh, weaving a cloth with, with very little source material. So we really learn something not only about Cleopatra's uh, upbringing, the education that people uh, got at that point. We also learn um, that uh, how she... Uh, ruled her country. She was one of the richest women, the richest uh, ruler at that time. And of course, uh, the story also tells us about her um, engagements uh, with the Roman Empire. Uh, Egypt was independent, but was a sort of protectorate of the Romans back then. We are talking about 30-ish um, uh, BC. Um, and so there is uh, Cleopatra's uh, relationship with Caesar and after Caesar's um, murder with Mark Antony, the power struggle in Rome between Mark Antony and Octavian. Um, so it, it really gives you a very flavored uh, story, not only of this fascinating life, but also of the historical background. Um, and Stacey Schiff goes to great length uh, to demystify uh, Cleopatra, and I mean that in a good way. So this this picture uh, we have in our minds, a lot of I had, and a lot of people have in our minds of Cleopatra as this uh, seductress who just brings death to all the men she's involved with. Um, so it's it's mainly um, an image of a sexualized woman and not of a very capable, intelligent ruler. So the the, the demystification uh, was one of the the things that I liked best of the book. And if you are interested at all in the life of this last queen of Egypt, because after uh, Cleopatra died, uh, Egypt became part of the Roman Empire and wasn't independent anymore until the 20th century. If you're interested in that, I can certainly uh, recommend this 2010 nonfiction book. So my two picks for two 2010, that was a bit of a mixed bag, but nevertheless, I was really glad that I read both books, even though the fiction pick was not, will not be one of my favorite books. Um, and as promised, I also want to talk about uh, the book published in 2010 that I really loved, and that is Lionel Shriver's book, So Much for That. Uh, Lionel Shriver is probably best known for her book, we, uh, we Need to Talk About Kevin, which had been made into a movie. Uh, you know all about that. Uh, she was born in the uh, US uh, and now partly lives in the UK uh, and partly in the US. And she is a bit of a controversial writer. Uh, I know that. But what I really love about L Lionel Shriver is that she is able uh, to pick very topical themes and 
is not afraid of causing controversy with those uh, themes. And the topic she picked in so much for that is um, the U.S. medical system. Uh, and the publishing year was quite it was quite on, on on the spot, to say the least, because 2010 was the year that Obamacare came into being. Um, and the, the book um, has uh, various uh, characters struggling with medical issues. We have the main character is Shep. He's a middle-aged man, not happy in, in his corporate job, even though he is quite successful. Uh, he wants to take the nest egg that he has saved over the years and go live in on some island, um, you know, uh, live cheap and enjoy life. But for some reason, that never came about. And when the book opens, a Shep is ready to leave and wants to talk to his wife about it, Glennis, uh, and tell her, either you go with me or I leave alone. But Glennis has news of her own when Shep started uh, to start to talk about because she just had a cancer diagnosis, a quite a rare cancer uh, that is not treatable. So the book then follows the struggle um, to deal with that cancer. Um, the nest egg, the savings are sort of withering away because of medical bills. And one of the questions raised is um, how much medical treatment do we want to um, subject ourselves to knowing that it might not really, it, it, it's certainly not curing us and it might only prolong our life maybe for a couple of weeks, maybe months, and the treatments are quite aggressive. There's also a Shep's best friend uh, who has a teenage daughter with a rare uh, genetic disorder uh, that the, 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 yeah, the, the outlook is bleak. Um, and the daughter is in her uh, teenage years and she will not uh, live uh, until adulthood. And the friend also then gets some medical issues that are quite hilarious, so I'm not going to spoil that for you. So the, the, the theme of medical care and what it means in the current, back then, system of, 2000, of, the, of the, the millennium uh, to get medical treatment and how far you want to go with that medical treatment. I thought, first of all, the book was really funny, um, despite um, the rather grim topic. Um, and I mean, I would have never thought that a rare cancer and an even rarer genetic disorder would make for an engaging page-turning read, but, but it did. So I learned something about the medical uh, system, but it was also a really, really good story. So these were the 2010 reads um, on to 2011. As promised, uh, my two picks for that year, just in case uh, you want to read along. And the first one, the fiction pick, um, is also a debut novel, and that is Thea Obret, uh, Obret's book, uh, The Tiger's Wife. Um, Thea Obret was born in 1985 in former Yugoslavia and she immigrated to the United States when she was 12. Um, the Tiger's Wife won the Orange Prize for Fiction. Um, so there you go. I missed a prize winner, as I regularly do. Um, and it's set uh, uh, in uh, the, the Balkans, uh, as far as I understand it, and follows the... Uh, the story of a young doctor, um, uh, Natalie, um, uh, who works there or who goes there to work in an orphanage. But it, it also has, uh, from the, the blurbs I, I read, and I didn't read much because I don't want to know too much about the story, but it's, it seems to have also uh, a mystical quality. Uh, Thea Obret's new book, Inland, um, was just published, I think, last year. A historical fiction about a frontier woman, um, also hailed and praised. Uh, and I read neither, so I thought uh, her debut novel, The Tiger's Wife, uh, would be a good pick for my 2011 read. Uh, for nonfiction, um, I picked a book by an author um, who you all know, Joyce Carol Oates. 
who is so prolific that I I read only a very small por- portion of her work. And I picked her memoir, a widow's um, story that she wrote after her husband of many, many decades uh, suddenly died. Uh, I have read um, mostly novels by Joyce Carol Oates and her uh, essays, literary criticism. Um, So I'm really uh, curious to see how she writes memoirs. And I think that the story of, uh, uh, you know, dealing with grief after your lifelong partner, or at least partner for a very big portion of your life, has died. Uh, That interests me, um, and I haven't read it, obviously. Uh, So my two picks are The Tiger's Wife um, and A Widow's Story, just in case uh, you are interested and you might want to read along. So this was it for my first Reading the Decade video. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it. As always, I'm looking forward to your comments, especially if you have a book published in 2010 that you really loved. Um, Let me know whether you are interested in uh, reading along with the 2011 picks, and I will see you all soon in the next one. Bye-bye.